It is January the 18th, 2010. We are at the home of Mrs. Clara Kehoe Cleland, born May 24th, 1927, in Bealton, Virginia. Melissa, Mrs. Cleland served in the U.S. Army during the Korean War as a first lieutenant in the nursing corps. She also served in Japan after the war as well as at Fort Benning, Georgia. She ended her career as a first lieutenant. Conducting the interview are Christopher Bryans, teacher at Community Christian School, along with Mrs. Kehoe's husband, Major General, United States Army, retired John Cle Cleveland, along with Alexis Carson and Courtney Barnard, students at Community Christian School. So Mrs. Cleveland, tell us something about your career. After finishing high school in Bealton, Virginia, at the age of 16, I moved to Corpus Christi, Texas. There I lived with my sister and brother-in-law, and I attended the Corpus Christi Junior College. After two years there, I was accepted at the Duke University School of Nursing as a cadet nurse. The nurse corps was set up in 1943 to alleviate the dire shortage of nurses. And we cadet nurses worked long hours in addition to our studies. We were furnished room, board, our meals, books, uniform, and a small stipend. Now, there were a hundred, uh, at the time, 80% of the nursing being done in, the, in that country, in our country, was done by student nurses. And 164,000 nurses finished under that program. I was in the last class, which when war had really ended in 1945, but there was still a dire shortage of nurses. When I uh, finished there at Duke and received my degree, the Bachelor of Science in Nursing, I stayed at Duke for a short while, and then I later decided I would join the Army Nurse Corps. I was sent to the uh, basic officer's course at Fort Sam Houston, Texas. And there, from there, I was transferred to uh, Walter Reed. And we were all supposed to be have a year in the general hospital before we went to another hospital. However, come June 1950, that changed. We were needed for the Vietnam, for the Korean War. On the 21st of July 1950, I received a call from the chief nurse there at Walter Reed. I was told to prepare to go to Fort Lewis, Washington to join the first Mobile Army Surgical Hospital for duty in Korea. Now, when my mother heard that, she was quite upset. You see, she had uh, four of her children served in World War II. The two oldest sons were bomber pilots, and they were killed when their planes went down over France. The, uh, another son served in the Marine Corps as a Corsair pilot, and a sister was in the Army Nurse Corps. She was in North Africa and Italy and France. And, but, uh, and she told me, now anytime you want to come home, you just let me know. I will write President Truman that on the, about the 26th of July, 50, uh, another nurse from Walter Reed and I went to Fort Lewis, Washington and we met many other nurses and doctors there to prepare to go to Korea. The, uh, we were given all our combat gear to go into combat and uh, all our sleeping bags, our, any, our, uh, Bar any what the, some people the men called barracks bag we had a little that too. <laughs> Finally, we sailed from the Port of Olympia, Washington, on the uh, MSTS O'Hara. 
Now, we were supposed to go directly into Korea, but by the time we got to Yokohama, they changed their minds and said, we better stay in Yokohama and wait for the next men going to Korea. And in August, we left the Yokohama. We stayed there in Yokohama first and helped with the 155th Station Hospital. But later we went from Yokohama and uh, on a Navy transport, the man, and uh, sailed into the harbor there at Incheon. And that harbor was filled with boat ships, large and small. And, of course, the uh, battleship Missouri was there. That was very imposing. And from our ship, we had to go in, climb down riggings to get into a smaller ship that took us ashore in Incheon. Once we got to Incheon, we went to an old building there that probably had been a schoolhouse. We don't know what it had been but previously. The uh, Now, I was with the group that went that way. We all stayed there, but one group went to a, uh, that went to a POW camp to take care of the prisoners of war who had been injured there. And they worked very hard, especially the nurse anesthetists. Now, our patients at that old schoolhouse were the in civilians who were injured at that landing. Now, the ones I remember most were the children. They were, some were burned, and they cried constantly, especially at nine. The, uh, there were no screens on the windows, so the flies came in, and there were maggots in their wounds. And those maggots did a pretty good job of debriding the wounds and uh, on the burns and the amputees. But uh, that didn't help those poor children to feel any better. Now you landed in the Incheon in September 1950, is that correct? No, let's see, I have the date on that we landed there at Incheon. It was 10 days after that famous landing. It was 10 days after yeah. the landing? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that was September. Mm -hmm. In September when we left uh, the port of, uh, uh, the port to go there, and it was 10 days after the landing. Ten, it was probably the, uh, about the 4th of October. And, no, it was about the 1st of October. Now, I hope that those children were sent to better hospitals once we left them there in Incheon. But on the 7th of October, we uh, went into the uh, to a city near Seoul. From there we joined the 7th Infantry Division and loaded there for security to make a trip down to Pusan. And it was about 3 o'clock in the morning, the next morning, the uh, first sergeant knocked on the ambulance where we were and told us to get out of the ambulance and sit on the ditches, which we did. And we sat there with, there were bullets flying back and forth and other things going on. But uh, we sat there until daybreak. At daybreak, they brought the injured from the unit, the 7th Infantry Division headquarters, which was just in front of us. They brought their injured men back to us to take care of them. And we did as good a job as we could since we didn't have any supplies there. And we took care of them as best we could. But we lost one who was the uh, headquarters company commander. And once while we were sitting there, they, uh, some soldiers came by at the last there and they brought the other units in to take care of that pocket of North um, of uh, North Koreans who were there and had been left there. And 
the, uh, some soldiers came by and saw there were women there, nurses. So they said, don't worry, women, we'll get you out of here. <laughs> they were probably six, 17, 18 years old. We liked their spirit there. We finally uh, left that late afternoon and uh, made the trip on go to go on to Pusan. We did leave some badly injured by the uh, hospital there in Tegu, and the rest of us went on to Pusan. And we were headquartered out in an old building near the racetrack in Pusan. And we uh, stayed there a few days and finally went aboard the ship, the Patrick, the MSTS Patrick. But we could not leave to go to, uh, to North Korea yet because the harbor at Wonsan had been mined and they had to remove the mining before they could get there. Well, one good thing while we were there in Pusan, we got to go off the ship and see the Bob Hope show. It didn't take long for Bob Hope to get over to Korea once the war started. It, uh, it was almost unreal to see that show there in the midst of everything going on. So was that, uh, when, when, when Bob Hope was there, he usually did these Christmas shows, but that was certainly much earlier than Christmas. Yes, that was, uh, yeah, that was October. That was in October. Right, but he wanted to get there when the first to cheer everybody up. Do you remember who he brought with him? You know, what, oh, what do you yes. remember about the show? Oh, Tell yes, us. there was um, the, the um, now which, which sisters were there? The... Um, and those people, I've got it here. Which one? Well, let's see. The Andrews sisters. I think yes, Andrews sisters. Andrew and sisters. And that other comedian who was with him, uh -huh. uh, who uh, Jerry Colonna, he was one there. I'm sure they never put on a better show there. Yeah, they definitely the Andrews sisters were there. Finally, uh, on the 28th of October. Uh, we did sail for Iwan in North Korea, and we landed about the 4th of November in first, uh, we were anchored out, and we were brought by LCMs into Iwan, and we spent the night there in Iwan in some old buildings, and I didn't unpack all of my sleeping gear. I had a cold night that night. I knew afterwards that we were in a cold place, so I'd better unpack everything. But uh, the next day after that, we went up to Pukchon to support the regiment you know, on the Yellow River. And in Pukchon, we operated the way uh, the, a MASH hospital a mash was supposed to operate. We had 60 beds. We took care of the patients immediately, got them immediately stabilized, and then they were sent back to a field or evacuation hospital. And uh, we had some interesting times there in Pukchong. We did have Thanksgiving there. And that was a, one of the best meals I've ever had in Korea. They uh, tried to get all they could there. Uh, once while we were uh, had, we had a uh, writer from the Saturday Evening Post come visit. She stayed in the overnight in now with the nurses in this old Japanese schoolhouse there. A Japanese built schoolhouse, I should say. They they were, of course taught Japanese and the uh, rest. The um, this writer was Nora Wong. She had been in China and she had written a great deal about the Chinese and uh, she w was doing the Korean and she predicted that uh, the Chinese would not come across the border. And they did very shortly. Now, 
Now, living in Korea was, and working there was certainly different from anything I'd done before. They uh, usually the old schoolhouses are tents. The last place I lived was a tent. And we wore uh, fatigues and boots or any uh, in tight boots that we could get to fit us. It was hard for me to really find some that would fit me. They had what they called shoe packs of good in the snow, and I put lots of socks on and wore those. And we slept in sleeping bags, those mountain-style sleeping bags. And uh, we had mess kits. We and uh, um, the drinking cup, we canteen, and uh, drinking cups, which we kept with us. Because that's the first place I drank coffee. We'd, they'd have some coffee ready at all times. Uh, so in the middle those, of the night, sometimes I'd have some coffee. So those are those metal drinking cups those metal that actually drinking. fit underneath the, 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 the canteen that you slipped right. off and mm -hmm. unbuckled the handle there. And yeah, we unbuckled the handle and took it to dinner. And we have a picture of the... Uh, the way we ate there, we'd we'd take our canteen, go get our meal from large serving dishes, and uh, the after we finished eating, we took our eating gear and dumped all the extra food off, we dipped it into hot soapy water, and then we dipped it into plain soapy water to rinse off the soap. And that was the way that operated. What did you think of the food? What uh, what, what was typical? Typical? Well, at first we had, uh, if we were traveling and didn't hadn't set up the uh, mess hall, we had some sea rations. Uh, but uh, when the mess hall was set up, we had a little, uh, we had some spam and we had uh, other, uh, and uh, they did get some eggs over there. So sometimes they had good pancakes for breakfast. Real eggs, not the powdered eggs? I think they got, somehow they got some eggs. And uh, I guess, I think for the, probably they had powdered eggs for the uh they had some way to get some, but they made what well, some of the best were the pancakes at breakfast. So I was usually ate breakfast. That was one of the best meals of the day. The rest might be uh, spam or uh, the B rations they call them. That was beef and gravy, pork and gravy, and uh, they uh, all out of cans, right? Yeah, they had the big cans of them that they served on, and. Uh, the, they did well with what they had, and uh, it was not not too bad. Since we had so many rations left over from from the Second World War, did you find yourself eating sea rations uh, that were five they plus years old? They probably were. Mm -hmm. Over mm -hmm. five years old? Yeah, they've been. And uh, the cans of, uh, I remember one of the nurses didn't want to ever see fruit cocktail again. Some people say they like that, but she'd had enough of fruit cocktail in World War II. But they did very well with them, and uh, they, uh, we had canned fruits and vegetables, and some, they made some sort of nondescript bread, and it was all adequate there. Of course, sometimes we got packages from home. And, uh, of course, our patients slept on these cots, too. So it was difficult to take care of them because they had to bend down to uh, take care of them. But uh, we did the best we could there. I think now in the receiving tent, they built some things over them so that they would be easy to take care of when they first came in. Although if we had a lot of patients, they weren't in, they were on cots too. And, and cots only were about what two and a half uh, feet off the ground. Just about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once while we were in Pak Chong, we said to get they said to get ready because General Allman was coming. 
to inspect the hospital. So, of course, everybody's rushing around, and we get everything set in about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. A uh, car vehicle pulls up at the front of the hospital, and out walks not Dunn Lawman, but Joe DiMaggio and Lefty O'Doul. Joe DiMaggio? Right, Joe DiMaggio. And uh, they came and visited with the patients. And so it was a great morale booster to see him. And Did you get a chance to actually talk to him? Yes, not very long. He was, was busy. Well, what were they like? What were Joe DiMaggio and Lefty like? They, they were very friendly with the, uh, with the patients. And the patients were just awestruck, I think, to see him there. And, but uh, they were both, uh, both very, uh, very, both very interested and very interesting. So we uh, we took advantage of any morale booster there, and it was very good. But it was soon after that the Chinese came across the border, and uh, we. Uh, it was pretty iffy. I had to be escorted to the latrine at times. They were afraid to, to let us very far out of the immediate area. But uh, after a while, it was, uh, I think it was the uh, 3rd of December, they decided we better leave Pak Chong. So we, uh, that was before that. I guess before that, because by the 5th we were down another. But uh, they got a pr some pretty good breakfast and uh, no time to pack any lunch. But we left on any vehicles. All the personnel just went in any vehicles that would move and we left. And uh, that evening we went to Hamahong and the 121st Evacuation Hospital was there. And they were filled with patients coming from the Chosen Reservoir. And they, uh, they, we helped them for a short while, but uh, by the 5th of December, they, we set up our own hospital, the first Maishas out at uh, Hung Nam. And uh, we were in an old building there. Now they had to, it was right there where we saw the harbor and the ships that were in the harbor. And the battleship Missouri was there and when they, those guns were fired from the Missouri. It would really shake the place. They had taped the windows so that they wouldn't break as a uh, bar, as the guns were firing around us. And uh, we took care of uh, Army Marines or uh, anybody, thing, any soldiers. And then we had at least one Korean we were treating there. And we were taking care of them so they could either go back to duty or go back to their unit or be evacuated. And uh, they are, uh, it was the um, 15th of December, we went, they decided we nurses should go out on the on MSTS ship in the harbor, the Ainsworth. My 121st evacuation hospital was had set it up as a hospital, and we went out and helped them take care of the soldiers, the wounded, and uh, we got lots of fireworks. We saw lots of fireworks with all the ships firing off into Korea, and especially a large number of them on uh, Christmas Eve. And on Christmas Day, we left for Pusan. We had a Christmas dinner aboard ship. And uh, the next day, we were in uh, Pusan. The, uh, we took our, our uh, patients were taken aboard other ships or sent back to their unit there in Pusan. And we knew the... First, uh, the uh, some people had come ahead and set up a hospital there, and, and we moved up to Kyongju. And there we started operating differently. 
There we start taking all patients, any patients who needed immediate care. We had lots with upper respiratory infections and uh, other ailments. So we were no longer just the um, surgical hospital. And we stayed there in Kyungju and for a while. Then we were sent, about the 13th, we went on to the um, city of Andong. And it was first we were outside the city, and they decided it wasn't secure enough, so we moved in, into the city of Andong. And we, uh, from there, we went on to Chichon. That was about the middle of February. And uh, there in Chichon, our uh, operating room was set up in an old bank vault. Our patients were in tents, and we were living in tents this time. One thing that uh, at Chichon, we had a visit from Grandpa Jones. Grandpa and, Jones. Then. And then they set us up at a in a field practically, and most it, we nurses anyway stood around them to see the show. But I was pleased to see uh, about 1960. I read in the Army Times that his daughter had been told what the uh, Grandpa Jones troop had done, and she decided she'd join the Army Nurse Corps. Um, now, this is the same Grandpa Jones that years later would be on the television show Hee Haw. Right, right? same and one. Same one for the Grand Old Opry. And yes, yeah, he brought his whole troop. The women stayed in the tents with the nurses. Yes, and uh, now one of the patients I saw there in Chichon with both his arms badly shot up, I would see later when I got back to Walter Reed. Now in April, uh, I received orders to go to Japan. Now I was there in Kyoto, Japan, the old it was an old capital city and a very interesting city in Japan. And uh, we had a rough trip going to, from Korea to Japan, though. We were on a, two of the other nurses and I were on a Greek Air Force plane <laughs> and that went from Chichan to Tegu to get on the C-54. That was one of the roughest flights I've ever been on, but the C Air Force C-54 was a nice flight over to Tokyo. Now in September, I received orders to go back to the USA. And after leave, I was stationed at Walter Reed again. I was on Ward 1A, and one of the patients there was Captain John Cleland. And uh, I got to see more of him. Now, come 1st of March, we were married there at Walter Reed Chapel. And he makes sure the picture is in. The, when I have a talk, he gets a picture of our wedding in there. So this was the this was the same captain that you treated there with his arms all shot up? Right. Mm -hmm. That's so. the same one. So what brought that relationship about? Uh, did you, he, you, you well, treated I, him, he remembered you, you got back to Walter Reed, did you keep in contact with? Is that how you knew he Well, he was a patient there, there at Walter he was Reed. was a patient there as well. On the same ward where I worked. Still recovering from his wounds. Still recovering. He was in the hospital a year after that. So, it took that long. He would be given, he would have one operation. He had recovered from that operation, have another one, and then another... So it went, the cycles went along like that. In fact, uh, when I first got to Walter Reed, he was off on a trip, so I didn't see him until the last of October or the first of November when he appeared back on the ward. So did he recognize you first, or did you recognize him? I recognized him first, I think. I don't think he was in such... I, he says he remembers me from there, but I don't know. <laughs> but I well remember his name, because I'd heard, seen the name... And, there's the uh, 
preacher to the university, Duke University, was James Clellan. He pronounced it Clellan because he came to Dukes directly from Scotland. And since we were married, I've lived in seven different states, I think, and two foreign countries, Germany and Thailand. And I've had, I have five children, ten grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. Did any of them follow in your Three sons uh, were in the Army at one time. They, um, one was an Army physician, and uh, one was an Army engineer, and one was Army infantry, and he, uh, they each spent about nine years in the Army. And then after Gary got out the infantryman, he joined the uh, reserves. And he was retired just a few years ago from the reserves. He had duty in Afghanistan. Well, thank you, Mrs. Cleveland. I'd like to ask you some, some other questions relating to your career. First, uh, you had mentioned that you had lost two brothers in World War II. Yes, I did. Who were uh, bomber pilots. Right. You mentioned that they were shot down and killed over France. Right. And yet, you decided to make the ar to to join the army and to become a member of the the army uh, nursing corps, um, despite the the impact that that, that had on. Army. Yes. What is it that most influenced your decision? to go into the army rather than to join the uh, 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 join say a, a local hospital become part of a local hospital I thought it would be interesting and maybe I do some good for my country too after my brothers had given their lives and why did you join uh, why did you choose the army rather well, than say the the air force I'd heard more service about service the army home. also I did or the navy I don't want to I like terra firma <laughs> I don't want that motion sickness. I have a weakness there. Yet, here during the Army to travel a great deal on ships, planes, and the rest. Well, tell us a little I bit. Also, had a, a my sister was in the Army Nurse School. Before you were? Oh, yes. She was in World War II and North Africa, Sicily, in North Africa, and Italy, and France. She spent and three years in. Overseas and 27 years altogether in the Army Nurse School. So that was certainly an influence for you. Right, I'd heard about that. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us about your most memorable experiences, your initial experiences in the Army, the initial training that you had before you uh, got, before you shipped out to Japan and then following that Korea. When I first joined the Army and was at the Medical Field Service School uh, in Texas, very good, very good training. They uh, were well organized there, and it was very good training. What did that training include? That uh, uh, it no firearms. No firearms. Now I understand. My daughter-in-law was Army Nurse Corps. She was taught it, but I was not. And uh, they uh, they uh, they covered the uh, covered things well for the Army, and then. Uh, at Walter Reed, I had a map good, reading. Oh yes, I had map reading there. Map reading, right? I had map reading. Uh, customs and courtesies. Customs and courtesy. Teach you how to march. Yes, the nurses marched in their white uniforms out on a parade ground there at near Old Barracks at Fort Sam Houston. You can see it. All those nurses out there <laughs> marching in white uniforms. <laughs> did it, did any of them had any difficulties learning how to march? No, did, did I you don't recall? think so. No, I don't think so. And uh, we were also taught the chain of command in the medical system, and how they brought the wounded and the uh, and the ch from. The unit field hospital of back and then back to the general hospital, and uh, ours is uh, the biggest hospital in one area. And then they were evacuated by plane or ship. Tell us about what a a, a typical before at least the the invasion by the by the Chinese in late 1950. 
uh, what what your typical duties would have been in Korea? There I was walk, working on the wards. We, uh, we would get our patients some, uh, we had varied patients. Uh, one had been shot in his chest and he had been flown over to the hospital. And uh, I saw him a few years ago. <laughs> and uh, one had had something fall on his chest. There were injuries like that. And uh, they had to pull his chest out. But mostly were the ones who did have some gunshot wounds or uh, uh, something there, and sometimes broken bones. Mostly they were in the cast. And uh, the uh, we uh, as in a general hospital, they had to be they had to be bathed if they were not do, able to do it alone there at the mash and uh, other uh, be taken care of there. We had uh, usually had a, two corpsmen along with the, these two nurses on the uh, ward. There was with the ward where they were had been operated and sent for care later. And they, later I went to the receiving ward and they had to have care before the surgery and of course the, uh, we had a small lab there and a s small x-ray department. Nellie uh, always they had to have uh, wet readings they called them in those days. They, they, this is very different these days but they had to have an immediate x-ray before they'd start. The, uh, uh, so we had, we had what, what, practically what was uh, a miniature of what is going on at bigger hospitals. Now, you one of the things that you mentioned is is early after your after the landing in uh, Incheon and then uh, um, up there in Iwan that you lacked supplies, a lot of medical supplies. They that you they were pretty have. good supplies, and we had the blood because mm -hmm. one time we pumped it in. When we did not have supplies, was on that ambush because we had we were just to go by convoy down to Pusan. We weren't really prepared that. We had some old supplies, which didn't work very well. So how did you, how did you handle that? Or what, what, how did you adjust they to They did the find some supplies? blood plasma in one of the, somewhere in their supplies that were coming, and it had been left over from World War II, though. And uh, they got some of that going, but uh, we, Bandage them, try to uh, stop any bleeding, and uh, of course the one who was one, the one man who was the worst one. The rest of them got immediate care, and we talked to all of them as they came in to see what we could do and and give them more support and morale there. About how many hours a day? Did you, did you, were you performing your duties? Usually about 12 hours. Were there sometimes any? more, sometimes at the last, they said they could give us a few hours less than that, so they'd give us a few hours. But that, uh, if anything happened, though, we were right in there. What is the longest stretch of, of uh, time, the uh, longest shift that you recall uh, having worked? Mm, probably. 16 hours, I expect. Was it difficult? Was the level of, of stress difficult for, for all of the nurses? Were, were there some that perhaps broke under the strain? No, no, I don't think so. We all, we were so busy and thinking about what to do, we didn't, we didn't have that much to think about there. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Well, this was certainly a question I was going to ask anyway, but uh, thank you, General. <laughs> well, there were, of course, after after the war, there was, as I recall, there was even a, a movie uh, before the MASH series had come out. There was a movie in the, in the early 50s um, that tried to portray the MASH, and of course, then there was the, the series uh, MASH that, uh, that had, oh, yes. had been on. So... Uh, was was uh, was it was there any resemblance 
to either the movie, the 1970 movie, or then later on the very famous TV series? Is there anything that looked familiar to you? Well, the uh, the tents, the um, everything was barren when I was there. There weren't those trees, and in that movie they do show that the there are trees around and there's forest tracing and things were green and pretty there, but not then. It was sort of barren. And the uh, the only resemblance I can see, with it, except for the tents, was the uh, a lot of patients coming in all at one time. That the degree of the number of patients. Now the uh, we didn't have the showers. We nurse all the personnel that didn't have any showers. We had to bathe from our helmets and uh, the and wash our clothes. There are some pictures that have been shown all of the nurses washing their clothes out of their helmets and hanging them to dry. I have a picture here somewhere of a oh this is one of them. Uh, they have it's the uh, and the old stoves there. And we usually put a can of water on there to get a little more, made the air very dry, so we put another can on there. Hold, 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 that, uh, hold that photograph right up in front of you there. I want to I zero in on it here. Yeah. All right, now, um, can you, are, are you in one of those photographs? Yes, are you, I'm are in, you one, in the back, photograph about here? the middle and the back yeah, there. Point, if you could point yourself out there as I'm showing this. Okay. That way I can here. identify you. That's you there, huh? That is I there, right. Focus right in on it. Oh, there you are. So what you're saying then, Mrs. Cleland, is that uh, the, the kinds of shenanigans and, and the pranks and um, oh. unprofessionalism in the in the series really had nothing to do with how a mash really worked. No, it did not. And they, um, and they had showers and they had an officer club. We didn't have that. And uh, what it probably was was a, uh, some special tent that they had there. And that's about it. Well, other than other than say the, the the Bob Hope show that you caught down uh, further south, uh, what did you all do for fun and relaxation uh, right right there when you when you when you were off duty, wherever you were? And we could read as one picture of me here reading while one of the other nurses are washing her clothes. We did have we had the stars and stripes. Which you have that did picture it. there? This is a mess line here. So there you all are all lined up, and uh, where are you, are you in one of those, these? Uh, yes, the people let's see places? where I am. I'm right here. Okay. The good looking one. Oh, I'll say. <laughs> That's another good looking one in there, I think. She's, she's deceased now. Now, I've noticed that in, in the photograph, there are, um, there is there's a black person in the photograph as well. Now I know that this was this was a couple of years is, after uh, President Truman had integrated now the armed this forces. Was, we had an ambulance company set up mm -hmm. right next to our hospital, and he's from the ambulance company. Um, they were set up right next door. All the drivers, all the men there were black. Um, they had uh, white officers. Commission officers, but uh, their NCOs were very good, and uh, so was a mess hall. and they had a, they had their own mess hall. We'd go eat with them sometimes. Mm -hmm. They'd do something a little different with spam or a, a hash or something, and uh, that made it more interesting. And uh, they uh, they were very conscientious taking those. They were the ones who took our patients from the hospital to um, the airfield or the train. That There was a train that came from Pusan up to uh, Chichon. And uh, when uh, there was a nurse aboard the train, and she would come stay with us overnight until the train went back to uh, 
Kusan. And uh, the, uh, now we did uh, every once in a while get to a shower point. It was go, the um, quartermaster court set up different ones, but the rest of the time we'd better bathe in our helmet there. And so how often did you get a chance to, to go to the shower points? Once a month, once every couple months? Um, every week or two, usually. Mm -hmm. Was it, how did, uh, you, um, how did the women norm respond to constantly having to bathe out of their helmet rather than being able to shower, something so far removed from, from typical American life? It was, that's what we had to do, so we did it. If you wanted to be clean, you wanted to do it. Were you able to stay in a regular touch with your family back in the States? Yes, they were pretty good mail service, except uh, after we went after we left um, North Korea, and uh, about the uh, the 15th of December, we left there and went aboard. Uh, I, we didn't get much mail there in Hung Nam, and then we were aboard ship. So we didn't get mail until we got back down to South Korea. And we found out that it was great, it was great to get even packages from home because it was Christmas time. Well, do you recall any particular humorous events and, uh, that, that happened, um, maybe pranks that were pulled, any, anything that you recall with a, with a kind of a humorous touch to it? Wasn't well, anything funny about it. <laughs> I don't think there was anything funny about it, but uh, we had great rapport with the different people, so we'd talk to them to try to cheer everybody else up. Everybody up. Some of these, uh, some of the doctors uh, had to leave for different reasons, and one of the nurses left in North Korea to go to uh, back to because she was having uh, ear trouble. So she didn't make it to South, back to South Korea, but she went over to Tokyo. Did uh, did some of the nurses find it more, perhaps more difficult than other nurses when when they lost a patient? I don't think so. Not while we were there. You know, the, I was the youngest one there. I was 22 to 23 years old, and uh, there some of those nurses were over 40. Some were in their twenties and some beginning thirties. What was the rapport among, among in the teamwork among the nurses, uh, despite the age age gaps? It was we had good rapport. Lucky thirteen. <laughs> yeah, the lucky thirteen. We were named the, the lucky thirteen. We were known as that after that ambush. Tell us about how did how did you get the how did you get the name the lucky thirteen? Well, we just decided it was thirteen nurses and. We were lucky to be there because we weren't far from uh, from where the uh, where that convoy was hit. If we'd been a little further around the curve of the mountain, we would have been hit. So that was probably the most the most harrowing, the most dangerous incident that uh, you recall that during during your time there. In yes, Korea. maybe we were in worse trouble up in North Korea before we came out, but they didn't tell us. To this day, they haven't told you. <laughs> no. I can imagine after all the books that have been written about it. Well, you had mentioned some some other uh, former patients that you had seen or or gotten to know after after the war. Uh, how many of these relationships have have you continued, and how have you managed to maintain contact with some of them? Well, it just happened that I remembered that name and I remembered him, and he I had met him before in in two different stations. And uh, some of the, uh, I had some of the wives, uh, when I, after I got to Fort Benning, I had some of the wives of these men who were in that ambulance company, I had some of the wives as patients there at Fort Benning. And I saw them there at Fort Benning, and uh, the, uh, let's see, there was a dentist who, we, who came over on the ship with us. I saw him again at Fort Jackson. It just happened to be that that's some place where I was. They were stationed. Roswell. And uh, 
some of the nurses, um, they were in Germany when we were there. Let's see, three of them were in Germany. Three or four of them were stationed in Germany when I was stationed in Germany. And uh, then uh, years later when John was on the board of the Military Officers Association of America, or TROA, the, uh, one of the nurses was on the board also. You had mentioned some of the some of the winters that you had to endure, the winter that you had to endure there in Korea. Um, were the winters considerably colder than that which you had grown up in? And, and I think in? so. In in Virginia, a little colder, much colder than Virginia. I just packed on clothing. Did you ever find out how cold it got uh, during during that winter there, that uh, 1950, 1951? I, the, Han, the Han River froze over. So that was certainly below zero. Well, below zero, I below believe. Below zero. Well, is there anything, uh, Mrs. Cleveland, that you would like to, to add uh, to our interview? Mm. That you haven't already discussed? These two young ladies would like to be nurses. What would you tell them, army nurses? I'll tell them what I and my sister say. It's one of the most rewarding experiences. And if you join the Army Nurse Corps, you're going to see the world because she has been stationed in uh, Europe and in the U.S. from West Point, New York, to Seattle, Washington. She's... Um, Sir, she served as chief nurse at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, Fort Eustis, Virginia, and she was chief nurse for the 8th Army in Korea. So uh, you'll, it'll be an experience that you won't find many other places. Well, this is a question that I also intend to, to ask General Cleland tomorrow, but uh, do you believe that there, there has been enough attention. Korea, the war in Korea has been sometimes known by, uh, by historians as the forgotten war. Uh, do you believe that there has been enough attention paid to the, the sacrifices that, that American men and women actually endured in that conflict? Yeah, there could be more attention because they were certainly uh, a great many, um, and they sort of, I think the historians seem to push it aside. Or maybe not historians, but <laughs> the media and the rest. <laughs> maybe they wouldn't even remember if it weren't for that MASH TV and movie. Well, may we never forget. Thank you again, Mrs. Cleland. Thank you. Much. Thank you. Okay, so tell us a little bit about this photograph, Mrs. Cleland. Well, this is, I think this is the first place where we were. Uh, no, I'm trying to think where it was, too. I can't remember for sure. And this is, um, I'm the one kneeling down to, to see the, the cot, to see the patient. And the one standing is uh, Lieutenant Jensen and... Uh, this was when they first started coming in on that. Uh, so this is on this is on one of the one of the cots that you had, and you had to bend down very very low, unlike right. unlike a hospital bed. Right. I, there I was kneeling tent. down instead of bending down, which mm. it was either one way or the other. Were you required to, uh, to also know how to um, uh, to to actually erect and to tear down all of those tents? Usually, we had enough men there. What we had, our job was to pack, to pack the supplies. And you had to be able to leave, I understand, within within six hours of notification. You had to be packed up, ready to go? Um, Is that true? No, we we were supposed to be. Luckily, we didn't. Even when we North, left North Korea, we had a little more notice than that to uh, get our pay. The, uh, we did have to get the last patients out that morning, and then we left that day. So we wasn't too much more than that. But uh, the uh, we managed it there. Now that building, that picture of that building uh, that that you were looking at uh, a, a couple of minutes ago, the oh, one that I had building. given you, 
Uh, tell us a, a little bit about about that that picture as Later, well as this We were this told next one. when we were there that um, this was part of a veterinary school where they taught uh, veterinarians. They did have a other places out near there, and they where they kept the animals, I expect, but it was a school there in Puck to mm -hmm. teach veterinary medicine. That's what we were told later on. That was on. South Korea. Now, North this one Korea. is in North Korea. That's in North Korea. That's in Puck Tong. I see. It's bigger than most of we stayed in in, in other places because yes. this was a big, big uh, graduate school, evidently, uh, is the, that under the, their auspices. Is that the condition that it was in when you were there? Yes, it was, just about. Looks like all the windows are blown out. Yeah, we had to do something about the. Um, we had to replace, they replaced some of them and boarded up some of them. And, and uh, what uh, do you recall when that was? Was it also during winter? The winter just started. They, we were there in November, and it was cold. So it was cold inside and outside. Now. Right. Freezing cold. Now, there's another picture there that's very meaningful to you, I see. Yes. <laughs> yes. Now, there's got this like out. This is a chapel at Walter Reed. Uh, now, boy, do I have a close-up of you, too. Mm -hmm. Very nice. You got your eyes closed there. Oh, I did? Yes, it looks like it. And the traditional swords there aloft yes. there for... Yes, mm -hmm. for your for your wedding. One man there later was a resident here. Uh -huh. His widow still lives here. His widow still lives here. Right. Wow. Well, she they were married.